Tuesday, September 27th, 2023, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So we're going to look at BRICS expansion today. And yes, many out there still think that uh, what happened uh, this summer was a nothing burger. But I think it's anything but. And uh, we're starting to see, at least I am starting to see uh, the effect of it. And I'm going to show you some charts to try to prove to you that uh, we need to brace ourselves. And uh, in what sense? Well, <laughs> listen to me and, and you'll find out. And, and before I do, though, just wanted to give you a little rundown uh, on uh, Rudy and the Shih Tzu breed. And many of you, of course, remember Billy. Billy uh, was here before Rudy. He passed away last December. He was 14 and a half. So I've got here the Pet Owner's uh, Guide to Shih Tzu, to the Shih Tzu, that, <laughs> a book I've had for many, many years. I I'll just give you a, a little uh, color on, on the breed. The Shih Tzu, uh, imported from its home in the East, has won over Western dog, dog lovers uh, with its distinctive looks and its lively extrovert personality. Once the holy dog of Buddhism, the Shih Tzu retains much of its oriental charm and captivates admirers, admirers worldwide. Small in size, the Shih Tzu is outgoing and friendly and will adapt to a range of different lifestyles. Uh, this is a breed that thrives on human companionship uh, and Shih Tzu owners will be rewarded with the most devoted of pet dogs. So yeah, they originated in uh, Tibet with... Uh, in the monasteries, uh, so uh, the story is that uh, Bud Buddhist uh, monks in Buddhism believe in reincarnation, and uh, they uh, the myth is that uh, one of the Shih Tzu, one of the dogs was reincarnated by a, a, a monk that had transgressed, and they called him a holy dog, and eventually uh, they gave him as uh, gifts to the uh, Chinese imperial family. Uh, they uh, were sneaked out after the collapse of the last emperor in the early 1900s and also um, during the civil war, civil wars of China in the 1920s and 30s to the West. And uh, yeah, that's their brief history. <laughs> and uh, I can vouch for uh, what they say here in, in the uh, book that uh, they're uh, one of the most uh, devoted uh, pet dogs. So that's the Shih Tzu and that's a little bit about Rudy and his background. So uh, back to the bricks and uh, I know there's a lot of debate out there and uh, I even think it's a little bit of projection and uh, am I trying to uh, cheerlead the bricks? No, uh, I'm just trying to observe things and uh, I think the BRICS uh, is a um, creation, of course, that uh, started out at Goldman Sachs. W one of the economists there uh, created the acronym. But uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, these countries, uh, Brazil, Russia, China, India, and South Africa, and now there, there are more that are going to join uh, 1st of January 2024, uh, they've kind of used that to their advantage, of course, to market themselves, uh, the acronym. First, it was BRIC because South Africa wasn't part of it. But I think the, uh, the key event, the seminal event that convinced these countries that they needed to uh, move on to another system uh, or uh, an alternative to the dollar system was the 08 crisis. And uh, there are many out there, of course, who poo-poo the BRICS. And I can understand why uh, a lot of these countries, uh, especially like Argentina, who's been admitted, they've been basket cases. But nevertheless, uh, I think if you uh, look at uh, their populations, uh, their G GDPs, uh, all the resources they have, they're becoming more and more important. 
But I think uh, back to 08 uh, is even uh, Hank Paulson, who was the secretary of the Treasury at that time. There's a documentary uh, about the fall of Lehman. And uh, there's a scene um, in which he's at the New York Fed. Yeah, he was the secretary of the Treasury, but he rounded up. Uh, he called a meeting at the New York Fed of all the major uh, U.S. bank uh, CEOs, And this was um, just after Lehman collapsed. And I remember it really well, that, that period. I was still working uh, in the financial sector in the city of London. I was sitting uh, in front of the screens. And uh, all we were talking about was what's going to be the next bank. You know, Lehman collapsed. Uh, we were talking about Morgan Stanley next. And, uh, and then Goldman Sachs. And then, you know... All the dominoes are falling and they had to bail them out. And they did, of course, with TARP and many other things, a lot of QE. And they allowed Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, well, that's the New York Fed, to become a bank holding company over a weekend. A process that usually probably takes years. And if you and I try to open a bank and go to the New York Fed and say we want to become a bank holding company to access Uh, the uh, the Fed window, they would laugh at us. But of course, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley probably own a lot of the Fed. So I've gone off topic here a little bit. But anyway, uh, there's a scene uh, in this documentary where uh, Hank Paulson is giving his uh, spiel. He's trying to convince the different bankers that they need to help each other or else they're all going to sink together. I remember especially, I think it was Mac, John Mack from Morgan Stanley. He looked quite arrogant. He didn't want to do it, even though his bank was going to go under. And uh, towards the end of his uh, pitch, uh, Hank Paulson, he said, the West is effed. I'm not going to say the word here. You can, uh, you can work it out. And he was right. And I think uh, other countries know that, especially the Chinese. Uh, did you notice that this summer Henry Kissinger went to China? And uh, I saw one of the photos of him in China meeting the Chinese officials. And guess who was behind Henry Kissinger? I noticed it. It was Hank Paulson. So Hank Paulson uh, is uh, part of the club, right? So what I'm trying to say here is that um, things are unraveling now. What Hank Paulson said in 08 is coming home to roost. And uh, that's what I'm trying to warn you about here, that uh, it's going to hurt us. And, and uh, is it any wonder that interest rates and yields are going much higher And you might say, well, that's because the Fed is raising rates. Well, they haven't raised rates uh, for a couple of the meetings recently. Uh, they've paused. Uh, and despite that, they've, they've been hawkish in terms of saying they're going to keep rates higher for longer. Uh, normally, when that used to happen, you would see the longer end of the curve, like the 10-year uh, and the 30-year uh, yields, go down. Because, and the reasoning uh, usually used to be, oh, uh, the Fed is fighting inflation. They're remaining hawkish. Uh, that's going to help uh, the longer end because people will be more comfortable buying those bonds because the Fed's tough on inflation. But now it's not happening. <laughs> the curve is actually steepening. And we've had Jamie Dimon. He warned his uh, top clients that uh, or his very high net worth clients that uh, the 10 year yield could very easily go to 7%. And I agree with that. So what's that all got to do with, with BRICS? Well, BRICS expansion added uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Iran, Egypt, Argentina, and Ethiopia. So six countries. Uh, but the key countries there, I think, are Saudi Arabia, Iran, and United Arab Emirates, because they've got 
a lot of energy resources, as we know, and uh, they're uh, the backbone of the petrodollar. And I'm not saying that uh, the Saudis are not going to continue to sell some of their oil in dollars, but I bet they're going to sell a lot more in renminbi or yuan and even other currencies. Uh, they, they could do deals with the Brazilians to trade oil in their own currencies, the real and the real. Uh, they could do deals to trade uh, with the Russians in rubles or even in reals. Uh, they could do deals to trade with South Africa in rand and real. So this is really going to impact uh, dollar reserves <laughs> and it might be uh, we might not be notice noticing it so much right now uh, but the other factor that it impacts is holdings of uh, treasuries and why is that well because a lot of uh, countries in the world uh, they've they've been keeping a lot of dollar reserves through holding treasuries and I spoke to a friend of mine who was in the bond market for like over 30 years. He dealt with uh, a lot of these uh, monetary authorities and even central banks from all around the world. And I asked him, I'm not going to give you his name, of course, but I asked him, uh, what would you say is the average maturity of all these uh, sent you know all these countries that hold uh, treasuries uh, and he said 10 years so <laughs> here you have these countries that are gonna need less treasuries because they're gonna have less dollars well they're gonna sell their treasuries and and I think that's one of the big reasons why we're seeing the treasury yields go up <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna show you why I think so so I've got a, a chart here of the 10 year yield and it's a weekly chart. Do you notice uh, last year in October, the 10 year yield topped at uh, 434 or 433. And uh, it had been going down this year since then. And uh, yeah, it was hovering just above 3% most of uh, the spring and summer. And then it started picking up. And this was in the run up, of course, to the BRICS uh, summit in August. And uh, I don't know if you remember uh, back in July, and this was in the beginning of July, July 7th, uh, there's a story that had come out out of Russia. Russia confirms BRICS will create a gold backed currency. And of course, uh, this is not going to happen overnight. A lot of people uh, assumed that was going to happen at the BRICS summit. I was a little bit skeptical because it took uh, uh, the European Union decades to create the euro. So to create a gold back system will take more than just a summit. But anyway, the story came out. It says Friday, according to state run RT, the Russian government has confirmed that Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, also known as uh, BRICS nations, will introduce a new trading currency backed by gold. The official announcement is expected to be made during the BRICS summit in August uh, in South Africa. Expected to be made, and, and they didn't really, but that's not my point here. So just remember that date, July 7th. So let's go to this chart and let's go back to uh, July here. Uh, so I've taken the week of July 10th. So we can see during that week, the 10-year uh, yield uh, got up to 409, had a low of 375 and settled at 383. So we're still below 4%. So, and ever since then, we've seen CPI in the U.S. come down to almost 3%, has rebounded a little bit, the economy has slowed down, and uh, yeah, things have slowed down. So uh, why have yields continued to go up like they have and made uh, a 16-year high? Well, that's uh, my opinion is that we're starting to see the effects of this uh, BRICS expansion 
and uh, the impact that it will have on the dollar. And uh, people who look at the dollar just through uh, the dollar index, yeah, they're myopic in my opinion because the dollar index uh, is really a measure of the dollar versus mainly the euro. <laughs> and is the, uh, is the European Union doing really well? No. The pound, is the pound doing well? Is the yen in Japan doing well? No. So uh, I think it's uh, really short-sighted and uh, it's a little bit of a cop-out to try to say, no, the dollar's king. And if you go back to 1973, when this dollar index was created, they created at 100. And now it's, I don't even know where it is exactly, 105, 106. So in 50 years, it's gone up 6% versus these currencies. And people don't even tell you that if you look at the dollar versus the Deutsche Mark, it's actually gone down since uh, 1973. It's gone down especially versus the Swiss franc. So what I'm trying to tell you here, yes, we see these short-term moves in the dollar index. And people might think, oh, the dollar is doing really well. And then we see people going, oh, the yuan is collapsing. But I think it's anything but. Uh, so this is a, a real uh, sign here, in my opinion, these yields going up. And what does Jamie Dimon know about what's going on? I think he was in China earlier this year, too. So are there any other signs that I see that um, things are getting worse for the West? I think so. I think it's all the, 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 the gold buying that's going, been going on by the Chinese public. And uh, we've seen that reflected in the, the big spreads between the uh, Shanghai gold price and the COMEX and London LBMA price. And that's continuing. I said that I wanted to talk, to the, uh, talk about this to you to try to help you safeguard uh, your pocketbook, so to speak. Well, this is gonna continue to uh, debase our currencies not just the dollar, the pound, the euro. And what does currency debasement mean? Well, a higher cost of living, higher uh, borrowing costs. But hopefully by now, you've been able to get out of all your uh, loans and mortgages. And if not, I, I think, uh, yes, even though they're going to be written off through inflation, you need to... Uh, in my opinion, try to get out of them as much as possible because you might not be able to uh, service them at, at some point. That's the other side of the coin there. Yeah, I know that uh, inflation writes off debt, but uh, you need to be able to uh, service them. So that's how I see things. Uh, so much for the nothing burger. Uh, so we're seeing record or well, 16 year highs in bond yields in the US. We're seeing the 30-year mortgage rate approach 8%. Uh, we're seeing a lot of gold continue to flow out of the West to the East. And, and uh, unlike the um, Chinese who have actually over the years encouraged uh, the people there to buy gold, you will of course not hear anything from a government encouraging us to have some gold because they don't want you in gold because uh, part of their game is this fiat Ponzi game. So with that, let's quickly look at where the markets are this morning. Um, stock markets had a rough day yesterday, gold and silver as well in dollar terms. I'm not concerned uh, one bit, of course. But uh, one thing I did that I haven't done since uh, February, March 2020, is I, I bought some calls on the VIX index. <laughs> and I did that through my uh, spread uh, spread trading uh, account here in the UK. And uh, at one point yesterday, it had a 68% profit, but it expires uh, 17th of October. Uh, I bought the 20 calls in the VIX. Uh, I, I think that's an interesting trade. It's not trading advice, but it's something that I've done. I'm holding on to it. It, not a big position, but if it works like I think it could, uh, could make a, a good 10, 10 time 
or even 15 time profit. And of course, the downside is just the premium that I paid for. So right now, spot gold is uh, trading at 1897. So it's just before 9 a.m. London. Uh, high's been 1904, low's been 1895. So yeah, we're down about four bucks in, in gold. Uh, the uh, spot silver price, 22.78, it's down seven cents. Low's been 66, the high 22.88. The Dow futures has rebounded. It's up 127 points. I think we're down uh, more than 400 points or so, or near 400 points yesterday. So this is just, a, in my opinion, a dead cat bounce. Uh, I think we're going to continue to see um, the market under pressure, stock market. The NASDAQ is up 83 points and the S&P is up 20 points. And of course, uh, the 10-year yield has come off a little bit uh, overnight. And you'd think uh, gold would go up because we're always told that uh, gold goes down because the uh, 10-year yield goes up. But overnight, the 10-year yield is down six basis points. It's at 450. I mean, gold should be higher. Just goes to show how they manage. Uh, the, the PPT manages everything. But I, I don't think they're going to be able to uh, contain this uh, continued drop in the stock market and continued rise in yields. Uh, to the currencies, uh, sterling is uh, down slightly at 121.47. The euro as well, 105.63. Uh, the dollar is down slightly, just uh, above 149 yen. And uh, the dollar is uh, up slightly at uh, 731 versus the U1. Let's check the uh, ruble. Uh, Rubo, uh, yeah, the dollar is down slightly, trading around 96.40 versus the ruble. Uh, Aussie dollar is still quite weak. It's below 64. It's down almost a third of a percent at 63.80. The Canadian Reichsmark, uh, that's unchanged. <laughs> the dollar is unchanged versus the Canadian Reichsmark at uh, 135.20 and uh, the Kiwi dollar is down 0.2 at 59.30 to the commodities uh, WTI crude is still really strong um, we're back up above 90 almost at 91 it's up 1% trading at 90.83 uh, Brent is up two thirds of a percent at 93.05 uh, Platinum is up three bucks trading around 909 and high grade copper is down a quarter of a percent at 365. So I'm gonna end it right here. We, we, we saw that 10 year yield uh, is down a bit. Uh, as I said, I think it's gonna keep going higher uh, in the medium to longer term. In the short term, we, we could see a, a little dip, but not even actually. <laughs> I think uh, the bond market is in trouble, the treasury market. And uh, with that, I'm going to wish you all a very good day. Take care. Bye.